Before we get started, I'd like to recognize some special guests that we have with us this evening. And I'll start with the uh, Ventura County Clerk, Mark Lunn. Mark, there you are. Great to have you here, Mark. <laughs> Michael Brewer, the son of Governor Brewer. Michael. <laughs> and of course, Duke Blackwood, our library director. Duke, please. Okay, I would like to take you all back in time to just under three years ago in January of 2009 and play a little game with you. I want you to imagine waking up on the morning of January 21st of that year to learn that you were about to become the governor of one of our 50 states. Now, we're gonna blindfold you and ask that you throw a big dart at the map of the United States. And whichever state it lands on, that's yours. You get to run it. Now, some people here are probably envisioning that their dart lands on, say, California. So we would finally have someone in charge with enough common sense. <laughs> to turn the state around. Now, some might be thinking Colorado for the great scheme. Others might think Florida for its winter, or Vermont for its colorful fall. But now I want you to imagine that regardless of where you're aiming, your dart lands squarely in the middle of the state of Arizona. Now, some of you are probably imagining its glorious weather with over 300 days of sunshine each year or its fascinating Native American and cowboy culture. Or the magnificent Grand Canyon, the rocks of Sedona, the red rocks of Sedona, the forested mountains of Flagstaff, or the amazing rivers and lakes that dot the landscape there. Now, our special guest today didn't hit Arizona with a dart three years ago by luck. She became its 22nd governor after many years of tireless work starting in the state legislature in 1982, moving to the state senate in 1987, the chairman of the Maricopa County Board of Supervisors in 1996, and its secretary of state in 2003. In that time, she has never once lost an election. If she had to do it all over, I am sure Governor Brewer, a 40-year resident of the state, would have chosen to live in and govern, govern Arizona as her first choice no matter where her dart landed. But it's the circumstances she inherited when she took the office where she might have wanted to see a change or two. She has had her hands full. Following the financial collapse of 2008, she inherited one of the worst financial crises of any state in the country. And like most every other governor, she's had to fight to diversify Arizona's economy to improve its share of higher paying jobs and reform its education system. But very few governors, in fact none, have had to face the challenge of their federal government refusing to exercise its constitutional responsibility to protect its sovereignty and the safety and well-being of its own citizens. Governor Brewer has. This governor's got grit. <laughs> she does not back down from a fight when it comes to protecting and improving the lives of the people of her state. <laughs> and her life is a remarkable tale. If you didn't pick up her newest book before you came in here, I urge you to do so on your way out. It is a great American story told by a great American governor that we are honored to have with us this evening. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Governor Jan Brewer.
Thank you all very, very much. Thank you. Thank you and good evening to you all. And thank you, John, for that very kind uh, introduction. I must tell you that it is uh, an extreme honor uh, to be here with you all tonight in Ronald Reagan's library. It, uh, it's uh, quite awesome. Um, thank you for allowing me to be here. I probably don't have to tell you that I love Arizona. It's my home. It's an extraordinary place. And after a long, hard day, I look forward to walking in my garden, to rest and relax and to enjoy the wildlife, watch the sunset, and plan for challenges that I will have to face tomorrow. However, there's something special about being here in this place that fills me with great joy and fills me with an overwhelming sense of peace. For me, this really is America's chapel, a place to find confidence and faith in our destiny. And yes, dare I say it, our exceptionalism. Outside, Outside these walls, those feelings have been hard to come by recently, especially for anyone paying attention to what is happening to our country, not to mention to the governors who have been battling the bureaucrats in Washington. Here in the Reagan Library, my spirit is lifted, and I am filled with renewed confidence in our country. I find myself thinking about young Americans and how things will look for them in decades ahead, and how we must prepare our children to compete and succeed in a changing world. I know this is much. To envision our future, we must understand our past. To decide who they will be and what they will give, young Americans must grasp what they have received. The year I was born, America was a nation of nearly 130 million people. Only about 40% are present size. And the world was at war. Three years earlier, we had been attacked at Pearl Harbor, where the USS Arizona still rests today. Our country sent its beloved sons to fight in unfamiliar places far from home, just as we have sent our sons and daughters today. We sent so many, and so many were lost. From the outpost in the battlefields of World War II, more than 400,000 Americans would not return home. It's hard to fathom those numbers today. Very few Americans even know them. The remaining survivors of that conflict the last of the generation which saved the world from tyranny, are in their late 80s and 90s. Soon, they will all be gone. Four days from now, we will pay tribute to our nation's veterans. So this is a good time for remembering. Dwight Eisenhower told his troops, poised near the benches of Normandy, they were about to embark upon the Great Crusade. The eyes of the world are upon you, he said. The hopes and prayers of liberty-loving people everywhere march with you. In company with our brave allies and our brothers in arms on the front, you will bring about the destruction of German war machines, the elimination of the Nazi tyranny over the oppressed people of Europe, and security for ourselves in a free world. Ronald Reagan called them the boys of Point Du Hawk, the men who took the cliffs, the champions who helped free a continent, the heroes who helped end a war. Those men are now our heroes, forever a part of the greatness of America. So when we gather soon for Thanksgiving, let us be grateful for the blessings of America and the sacrifices 
of those who built it and let it to us. My father, Wilfred Drinkwine, was doing his part fighting the Nazis, working as a civil servant at the Hawthorne Navy base in western Nevada. He passed away when I was 11 years old. His death came after a long and painful battle with lung disease, contracted following years of exposure to the hazardous chemicals and toxic fumes at the base. Even in the end, when my dad struggled for breath, he never regretted serving his country, and I am proud to tell you of his patriotism. I'm also proud to tell you that the most important mentor in my life was my mother, Edna Drinkwine. You see, I know what it's like to be a single mom, struggling to make ends meet while caring for your family. I saw my mother do it after my father died. She had never worked outside the home, but my mother knew she had to support her family, my brother and me. With meager savings, she bought a very small dress shop, and I worked side by side with her until the time she sold it when I was 20 years old. That dress shop was really a classroom for me where I learned the importance of hard work, responsibility, honesty, integrity, and yes, courage from my mother's example. I think about my mother every day, especially since I was challenged with the opportunity to become governor of Arizona. I say challenged because I inherited the worst state budget deficit in the nation. Well, I am my mother's daughter. I was up to the challenge. I'm a problem solver. I made a lot of painful decisions, some that still weigh heavily on my heart. In Arizona, expenditures are almost down 20%. The number of state employees is down almost 15%. And state employees, including me, took a 5% pay cut during the crisis. But you know what? We now have a balanced budget and a positive cash balance for the first time in years. And it feels darn good. Our state government is smaller. Our state government is more efficient. Our state government is focused on the future. Arizona is poised to move into our second century with the creation of a new model to advance our economy. The Arizona Commerce Authority is a public-private entity focused solely on quality job retention and recruitment. Meanwhile, education in Arizona is being transformed it's a transformation supported by education and business leaders all across America. Called Arizona Ready, we're engaging families across the state to take charge of their children's education and to expect more from their public schools. These reform initiatives include adoption of higher academic standards and the elimination of teacher tenure. They include employment policies that prohibit giving retention priority to teachers based on seniority, and we're ensuring Arizona has a state-of-the-art educational data system so teachers have real-time information that can be used to improve instruction so that they can be held accountable for their results. Now, fixing what afflicts our great nation will not be so easy. However, if there is one thing I learned from my mother, in my years of public service, it's that life is about choices. It's that doing the right thing almost always means doing the hard thing. It's choosing what's tough over what's tempting. It's choosing the truthful over the false. Speaking about choices voters had before the 1984 election, President Ronald Reagan said, and I quote, the choices this year are not just between two different personalities 
or between two political parties. They are between two different visions of the future, two fundamentally different ways of governing. Their government of pessimism, fear, and limits, and ours of hope, confidence, and growth." End of quote. It seems to me there are still two very different visions of the future. We face increasing economic and military challenges around the world. Yet, we have a president more inclined to apologize for America than to first uphold her principles. We have a president who seeks deeper division through class warfare, a calculated politics of envy, and cynical appeals to racial grievance, even as he issues earnest sounding calls for civility. We confront persistent economic instability and decline, yet we have a president who demands more of the same big government excess that triggered it. But what should bother us most is that we have a president who suggests that America is not an exceptional nation. Imagine. What other country has sent its finest young men and women to fight on distant battlefields for justice and peace? What other nation ever rose to such strength, yet rose not to conquer, but to protect? What other such nation has acted not to dominate, but to liberate? We are an exceptional nation, all right. That's just a fact. written in blood and sacrifice of American patriots and their families. President Obama doesn't have much in common with Ronald Reagan, but the principal difference between the two men is fairly simple. One longed to spread the wealth, the other lived to spread freedom. In my book, Scorpions for Breakfast, I tell of my meeting with President Obama in the Oval Office when I looked him in the eye and I told him I didn't want to talk about his so-called comprehensive immigration reform while our border was out of control. I stand here today aiming to make a simple case on the subject of America's border with Mexico and our immigration policy. I know my words will be distorted by those who disagree my opponents have already painted me as hard-hearted and uncompassionate. They're wrong. My career, my record, my life all stands as proof as to how wrong the critics are. The truth I've come to share with you is anything but hateful. It has nothing to do with skin color, nothing to do with extremism. Instead, it's rooted in freedom. My truth shares the spirit of our Founding Fathers' quest to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty. We must secure Arizona's and America's southern border. That is my truth. We must secure our border to keep our citizens safe. We must secure our border because we are of a nation of laws. We must secure our border to ensure our future relationship with Mexico. There is no other choice, no better option. There is no next best, easier truth. Of course, there are those back in Washington who will tell us from 3,000 miles away that our border is more secure than ever. Tell that to the survivors and friends of Robert Krentz, a dedicated community-minded man shot to death on the same Cochise County Ranch 
his family has called home for more than 100 years. Tell that to the friends and relatives of brave and noble patrol agent, Agent Brian Terry, a victim of a border gang that was armed by our own federal government, allowing guns to be shipped into Mexico in the scandalous Fast and Furious operation. Tell that to the Arizonans who wake up to find drop house raids in progress or witness high speed chases on our freeways in our neighborhoods or who spend hours in an overburdened emergency room on a Saturday night while waiting and consoling a suffering child. Tell that to our taxpayers forced to bear the expense of state and federal prison cells overflowing with more than 630 thousand illegal alien felons at a cost of more than 1.6 billion dollars each year. Those are the facts, plain and simple. Our opponents, the self-styled do-gooders, try mightily to bury them. They spin and shout, hate and denounce. To disagree with them, I've learned, is to suffer incredible verbal abuse. But let me assure you, I can live with those consequences because I believe in the truth. And I believe in taking action to protect our hard-won freedoms. I sometimes wonder whether the present time was inevitable and whether, in fact, the struggle will make us stronger. You will see it obscured in our left-tilted media, but I believe the American people are taking this in right now and moving to correct the course. The 2010 election was historic and consequential. And if we continue to pull together and work hard, there is going to be another like it in a year from now. When I was here in February for President Reagan's centennial birthday party, former Senator John Danforth described Ronald Reagan as an example of someone who lit the life given to him on a lampstand shining, not on himself, but on America and onto the world. It is Ronald Reagan's America. It's that special city on a hill. And I believe it's in that shining city where we might meet Ronald Reagan again one day and be able to take his hand and thank him for the nation he preserved for us. As a Western governor, let me close with the famous prophecy of an English poet, one that Margaret Thatcher quoted to Ronald Reagan as he headed to his California ranch in his retirement. And not by the eastern windows only, when daylight comes, comes in the light. In front the sun climbs slowly, how slowly. But westward, look, the land is bright. Thank you, and may God bless you and your families, and may God always bless the United States of America. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so very, very much. <laughs> we have time uh, just for a few questions, and then the governor will be signing books for those of you who are wise enough to get one, and still will get one. Uh, if I could just ask one favor before you uh, ask your question, if you could raise your hand. We see we have staff in each of the aisles. If you could just hold up your hand, and they'll give you a microphone and introduce yourself, and we'll go from there. Yes, right here. 
I'm John from Burbank, and I was wondering if there was any possibility of you using state resources to prosecute uh, some of the people involved in Fast and Furious. Well, you know, first we have to find um, the details, and certainly the investigation is going on, but I would assume that indeed that, that will be handled on a federal level. I will tell you, as you all know, um, uh, the four states today, of course, we are just getting our budgets under control. We don't have a whole lot of money, but I think that certainly uh, that we're going to see prosecution and that persons are going to be held accountable uh, for what indeed has taken place in Arizona and in America. Over here. Hello, uh, Mike Hernandez, Caleb Communications. I just want to thank you for uh, sh championing SB 1070. And I know you uh, have um, a recent press release said that it would probably go all the way to the Supreme Court. Uh, would you consider your championing the immigration issue within the GOP and maybe inviting some of the other governors that have been sued and who are facing the same situation that Arizona faces now? Well, I think that you know each state, we believe certainly in uh, the new federalism where every state has all their rights, but we certainly have all joined together uh, knowing uh, certainly uh, what America is, is facing. And I've had so many of our governors, uh, not only uh, close to the western area of America, but throughout that have been very, very supporting us. And we certainly reach out and support them. And I'm sure that if we don't get some relief uh, soon, uh, that there probably be, will be a national movement. But I am really uh, looking forward uh, to this next election, and it's going to count on a lot of people. And I think if we see an exceptional election year in 2012, we might have the battle won. Hi, I'm Victor from Calabasas. And, uh, I, my impression of the current administration is that their belief system is that this is an unfair world. And the only way for people to get ahead is to take from somebody else who's accomplished something. There was a recent statement on the part of the administration that, as you said earlier, America has lost its exceptionalism and its specialness. The two are in conflict with each other. You can't have one and the other at the same time. If you were running things, what would be some things that you would suggest to turn the country around somewhat quickly and somewhat effectively? Well, I think first and foremost, we have to remember what America was built on, and I think that we all know that America is all about freedom. Um, and I believe so strongly, and I think that every president and every administration ought to look to the states to give them the federal responsibilities that, that are, are given to them in the Constitution. And I also believe that it's the federal government to have a strong defense. I, I, I see a complete division, of course, between the federal government and, and the state government. And I, I, I <laughs> the federal government just simply cannot do it all. We don't want them. We know better in our states what is best for our people than the federal government knows 3,000 miles away from us. And they just keep inflicting upon us, certain this last administration continues to continually mandate mandate. So I would say no way no, under any circumstances will we do that. Um, we hear from, from, from every governor in the state, Republican and Democrat, get the government out of our lives. We have to get our tax situation under control. We've got to get our, our health situation under control, and it certainly isn't Obamacare. I mean, that is Obamacare. <laughs> one of the states that led the charge on that. And, and we will continue to do what we believe is right. Um, I think if we get back to our principles of what this country was founded on, America will be that great country that we know so well, that exceptional country that we have fought for and that we need to maintain. And it's going to take all of us, you and I and everyone in America, fighting hard and spreading the truth. And I will again tell you, Doing the right thing almost always means doing the hard thing. But Americans are up to it. Hi, Governor Burr. I'm Anne Marie Morrell. I'm with Patriot Update. I don't have a specific question, but um, you're the reason that I got involved locally in politics. 
I started writing. I started writing, actually, I write for Michael Reagan's Reagan Report sometimes, and um, I have a little video show. I was terrified, you know, living in California, it's hard to be a conservative in a liberal kind of place, <laughs> but um, after I saw you standing next to that sign that said, you know, are in America saying, stay out because, you know, you're, it's dangerous in our own country. And when I saw you standing up to Obama and you didn't back down and all of us kept thinking, she can't keep going like this. She's going <laughs> to give in. She's going to chicken out. Somebody's going to back off. And you never did. And you, you just sat there and you just, all you wanted was to defend your own state. So I, you are such an inspiration to me, and I can't shut up anymore. And I never <laughs> will again. I, I never will again because of you. Thank you. Thank you so very, very much. And you're just exactly what the Grand Party, the Republican Party needs. And I'm, I so much appreciate your comments. And it is amazing when you think about our federal government coming into my state, 80 miles north of, of the border, and putting signs in my desert where we walk and hike and recreate, saying, travel at your own risk. And if you see anything, call 911. And he tells me it's not a federal issue, you know, that it's not a state's issue, but call 911. I wonder who he thinks is answering those phone calls like 911. <laughs> and, that's, and that's not, you know, protecting my state. That is flat out surrender. It's, it's just um, absolutely coming here and being with all of you tonight. It's like being actually in a safe port amongst a storm. If we don't all come together and we don't all stand on our principles and get the right pack, the right people elected, um, where are we going to be? And we will have no one to blame but ourselves.